Bom, uh, boa tarde a todos. Vou tomar... Good afternoon, everyone. I will speak Portuguese due to the fact that on this panel we have Portuguese and Spanish speakers. I'd like to thank you for being here. I think we have a unique opportunity today. The title of this panel is, to fi is Finding a Balance for the Amazon. We have a very well-represented Amazon here. President Petro representing the west of the Amazon. Pres uh, Governor Barbalio representing the east. People from the different the different peoples from the forest through Kuro and of course Minister Silva as well and a person who likes to invest in the sustainable agenda Elon thank you very much for being here thank you all we know we will not find solutions for the Amazon by discussing these solutions within the different cabinets offices and ministries we have to get to know the Amazon because the solutions for the forest have to go through being able to listen to the people who live there. In Brazil alone, we have 27 million people who live within the forest or right outside of it. So I invite every single one of you, if you want to discuss a sustainable development agenda for the Amazon, to really get to know the Amazon and to go there. I would like to ask President Petro for uh, the possibility of asking a woman to start. We have here a person representing all the indigenous populations through COICA, the coordination of indigenous peoples from the Amazon Basin. Thank you very much, Fanny Kuiru, for being here. And we because we're saying that we need to listen to the Amazonian people, who, to the people who live there, I'd like to start with you. What message do you want to send to people here in a forum such as this one, with the people who are here listening to you at the World Economic Forum meeting? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I would like to send a speci special greetings to all uh, the personalities, uh, ministers, presidents, all present here. So my first message from uh, the coordinator for indigenous nations of uh, the Amazonian Basin, which is the main uh, institution for communication at a national and an international level, well, I have uh, several messages. First, uh, th those who finance the Amazonian forest and invest in it should know that it is home for 500 in each, uh, indigenous peoples. We have uh, different uh, knowledge systems, that are, that are different from uh, the traditional ones. We also have a cultural wealth. We have more than 300 indigenous languages distributed in the whole Amazon basin that we need to preserve. Second of all, we need to acknowledge the, ind the indigenous peoples as the best preservers for the Amazonian forest. Those territories are the territories that are best preserved in the whole basin because we r respect our territories and our natural resources. Third message, we as indigenous peoples, we should participate in the decision-making process that affects the Amazonian forest. We should not remain only people that are there that do not have any knowledge about the Amazonian forest. But we need to be included as main actors in the preservation of the Amazonian forest. Until now, only 28% of the Amazonian basin belongs to the indigenous peoples. So our purpose here is to safeguard the judicial and legal security of our people so that we can carry out our preservation efforts. Fourth message, in order to support, we, we need to support 
the initiatives coming from the indigenous people in the Amazon basin because we have been we have been doing different <coughs> efforts for a long time but in order to support that we need to co-create financial mechanisms that are viable for example nowadays we have created an indigenous economy funds which is called Amazon the Amazon for life a fund that was created with the development inter-american development bank because we policies should not be implemented from up down rather than that we need to co-create so that we can make sure that indigenous peoples have a decent life that's the main thing we need to guarantee a decent life for indigenous peoples and then we should take care of the rest of society and that's why we call for other actors to participate in this fund that already has um, gathered $10 million, more than that, actually. We need to improve the living conditions and preserve the fundamental rights of the indigenous peoples of the Amazonian territories. We need to make sure that we have access to education, health, and the rest the fund of fundamental services. Thank you very much. Because you spoke of investment, let's go straight to Ilan. You are an economist. You have a moderate view. You are a former president of the Brazilian Central Bank. And today, you are a voice that many listen to. You're currently the president of IDB. Ilan Goldfein, thank you very much for participating in this panel as well. And going along the lines of what Fanny mentioned, the IDB has increased year after year its investments on the environment, and I'd like to ask you why you're doing that. And in your opinion, what's the importance of a development bank in terms of this regional agenda? Thank you very much. It's an honor for me being here and sharing this panel with every single one of you. We've been working together with all of you this year in a very intense way, both in Colombia, with Gustavo Petro, thank you very much. Marina, thank you as well. Fanny as well. We've worked together and the governor of Pará as well with a launch we had there. So it's a pleasure to have this panel where we see many people working in the same direction. Luciano, you asked me why we're doing this. In economic terms, we're working for the common good, something that you cannot have just the private sector or just the government or just the indigenous communities working on. It needs to be a joint effort. And we need to do it jointly because for global biodiversity to exist, you need to fight deforestation, but at the same time, you need to fight climate change, global warming. And to be able to get there, we need to work at scale and with impact, with direct impact. So to be able to work at scale, we need a model that goes beyond individual initiatives. When I joined IDB, I had come from Brazil, I passed some time, I had spent some time in the United States, and there was an initiative for the Amazon already inside IDB. But it was just an IDB specific initiative. And on July of last year, we said, well, maybe we can help coordinate the different initiatives that exist, the different actors, and bring them all together, which is why we created the Amazonia Center through a meeting that we had here in Davos with Minister Marina. She was the one who said, why not think about Amazonia sempre, Amazonia forever. And I think it's gotten a lot of traction. It's moving forward well. So we need to think about the Amazon, not just in terms of c control and monitoring, but rather thinking about people. 
which is why we're thinking about the communities that Fanny mentioned. And also thinking about the cities, because a lot of the population lives in these cities. So we need to think about infrastructure in these cities, sanitation, economic activity, just projects that consider preservation or fight deforestation is not enough now. We need to also think about economic activity, and that's where we can develop bioeconomy, for instance. Today, we have a green coalition. All the public banks during COP have committed to finance from 10 to 20 billion. We have established a network with the different cities and municipalities. We have a network with the different countries in the Amazon region. So many initiatives that we are driving. And to conclude, I want to mention the impact. If you work at scale but you have no impact, it's no good. So when we talk about reducing emissions, we have to link that to an objective, to specific targets. And when we talk about fighting deforestation, then for that as well, we need targets. And let me conclude by saying that financing and resources, we also have to consider what kind of instruments we're going to use. And with the World Bank, we decided to try and conceive some kind of Amazonian bonus. What's the advantage of investing in this area? So it's a program, a holistic program that needs to be well coordinated, looking at people, cities, monitoring, agriculture as well, all working together about the impact it can have in concrete terms. Thank you very much. Let me give the floor to the governor of the state of Pará. He was re-elected. It's his second term, one of the biggest victories among Brazilian governors, his second election. His state is bigger than Texas and California put together, and today a very big responsibility in terms of the amount of the Amazon that lies within the state, and of course they will be hosting COP30. Thank you very much, Governor, for being here. I think you have a huge challenge ahead. Uh, it's great to see your political will, the fact that you want to produce yet be sustainable. However, today, Pará is the second biggest state in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and it has the biggest, uh, the second biggest livestock in Brazil as well. So tell us a little bit about how you'll manage this incredible environmental asset and of course linking that back to the indigenous peoples, how can we make sure that for the people who live in this area, the forest has more value if it's left standing than if it's cut down. Thank you very much. Thank you to the World Economic Forum for inviting me to participate, especially in light of all the diversity and the important leaders that are here, people who are truly committed to building a new momentum and a new moment for people and the relationship to the environment and to nature. The state of Pará has huge challenges. We are a very large state, 70% of our land is native forest, but at the same time, the anthropocized area is important in terms of food production and 9 million people inhabit our state. So we need to make the challenges that we face, economic challenges and environmental challenges compatible, find a new model to use land so that it can be sustainable and it can allow for development to happen. We're fir we first started acting by fighting all illegal activities and helping Brazil reduce deforestation. The state of Pará used to be the biggest villain in terms of deforestation, but now we have become more and more the most important in terms of reducing these emissions from deforestation. In the year of 2023, we had a reduction of 46% in deforestation compared to 2022. This is about 1,500,000 square meters less that weren't deforested. 
So this shows the shift we're trying to implement. But I always say that you, of course, have to have command and control, but it's not the only thing that's important. So we need to build a transition. And I'd like to highlight the choice our state has made to try and find funding to decarbonize its economy as it's done with the IDB. So we're trying to value forest as an asset with a bioeconomy plan that we've drafted, with a reforestation program, by also structuring a carbon market system so that we can ensure that we will have green jobs and we need to make the agenda of sustainability and the challenge of sustainability compatible with the challenge we face in terms of social and economic development. Hosting COP30, which is the biggest event to talk about climate change in the globe, is a huge opportunity in order for us to have some legacy, a legacy that's both environmental, social, but also the infrastructure we will have in our state. So this is the path that we are going to go through, and deforestation reduction, I'm certain, will reduce more and more. We will continue to contribute to the Brazilian NDCs, and we will make the state of Pará not just a state that provides uh, ores and food, but rather a state that sees that the solution lies within the forest. And that's the, mom the movement, the shift that all of us who are here need to lead. Identifying the forest as a solution to reduce deforestation, but also as a solution for social aspects, for the people who live within it. As soon as we're able to make sure that a living, a standing forest is worth more than a forest that is cut down, then we will have conquered a lot. Society will help us preserve it, not just because it helps balance the climate, but because it provides them with a definitive solution to their social livelihood. Thank you very much. I'd like to give the floor to someone who is currently the Minister of the Environment, but she's also so much more, Marina Silver. She's a dear friend. It's an honor to share this panel with you. I think it's very clear that the Amazon is an essential part of the balance we seek for the entire planet that idea of having a standing forest that is valued. And we have a huge challenge of preserving, but also developing, generating income for the populations who live in the forest and outside of it, right outside of it, without harming the environment. And we also have the market aspects that need to be considered. So investors are trying to identify the value of the forest and this is up for debate. So how do you see these issues and what are the main challenges that you will face now as Minister of the Environment? Thank you, Luciano. It's a great pleasure being here as part of this uh, panel with all the different partners, President Petro of Colombia, representatives from the indigenous peoples, who kind of set the reference for the debate, and the governor of the state of Pará, a very important state, in light of everything the government, the governor has just exposed. Luciano, I think the Amazon, as you mentioned, is a space for solutions, because it represents a solution for the balance of our, in, of our climate, for the entire climate, but also because of a paradigm shift. In the Amazon, about 80% is preserved, but about 18%, per, 19% uh, has been anthropocized. However, the Amazon has the possibility of now establishing a new paradigm so we don't repeat what was done in other areas, as was the case of the Atlantic Forest that used to have 
1,300,000 square kilometers, and now we only have about 9 to 10 percent of it, the Atlantic forest still standing. We can do things differently in the Amazon, but in order to do that, we have to first of all respect the ancestral knowledge of its peoples, peoples who have been using nature for a very long time. And also we need to learn from nature itself. Nature and in the Amazon, this is even more obvious, is very diverse, diversified. Why do economic models have to be so homogenous? So in order to respect the Amazon and be able to develop the region socially, economically, we also need that economy to be diversified. Another important aspect about the Amazon is being able to value what some people call its environmental assets. I prefer to say its, its ecosystemic services and its colors, its sounds, everything that the Amazon represents for its people, but also for the entire world. Having a development model that is compatible with sustainability in many different dimensions beyond sustainability economic, social, and environmental sustainability, we also need to look at cultural sustainability, political sustainability, because what we will do with the Amazon depends on political decisions. And also aesthetic sustainability, because it's one of the most beautiful and rich areas of the world, but also one of the most fragile. So we have I, I always say that we have most of the technical solutions, but we need the ethical commitment of using the technology, the knowledge that science has produced, having public policies that are based on evidence, but that are linked to the ancestral knowledge of traditional populations. We already have technology to develop bioeconomy, but what is our ethical commitment to be able to get the financing and investment needed to get it going. And we know that products, materials can be generated based on all that biodiversity. So where's the problem? Well, a lot of the time, the alternatives we create do not have a market. They do not appeal to the market. And now we're finally opening our eyes to be able to have financing and strategic programs in these areas while at the same time creating markets for these products that are not just concrete products. So diversified economy, valuing our social biodiversity, and making sure that financial resources are allocated to ensure that projects can be developed, both public resources, private funding. The financial system has to reinvent itself to be able to consider the need to support these environmental assets and to align all of that with the strategic decisions that have been made. At COP28, we've just made a decision about the need for adaptation and mitigation with a reference that is set for all of us. And this is how I will conclude. At COP28, we stated that a transition is needed to eliminate fossil fuels and we need to precisely think about the solution and this transition. For 31 years we've been talking about climate change, but we all know that the main problem is fossil fuels. And so we need the transition to happen while involving oil producers, oil consumers, being able to also deal with food security, low carbon agriculture, and the Amazon can be part of the solution. But I think most of the contribution is already there. It produces 20 billion tons of water per day. It's responsible for the balance of our planet. That's what it's about. Even without any economic activity, the Amazon, because of the rain it produces, corresponds to 75% of the GDP of, the, uh, of South America. How could you destroy that? But that's what we've been doing. We've been destroying this, this uh, asset, which is so important for our GDP. Finally, COP28 has mentioned a path 
for the transition and transitioning out of fossil fuels. Brazil was brave enough to talk about zero deforestation, and we have now the federal government and the state government working together in that sense, and this is how we will be able to find solutions. As Poet Tiago de Mello said, sometimes you do not have to find a new path. You just have to find a new way to go forward. And this is how, and this is what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And to conclude this first round, after one and a half years of uh, uh, in the presidency of Colombia taking the environmental discussion to yet another level, 42 percent of its uh, territory is uh, covered by the Amazon forest. Thank you very much for being here with us, President. You have a strong environmental narrative, and you have been very brave to criticize the uh, your peers in the region. You have insisted on environmental agendas. So how can you describe your journey so far? What have been the challenges you have faced, especially in the environmental area, considering the Amazon? Bien, nosotros hemos reducido sustancialmente we have uh, substantially reduced uh, deforestation by 70 percent, more or less. And there are different economic uh, strengths and forces uh, that go against uh, the Amazon, the idea of uh, larger properties of uh, soil and land as a criteria, as a wealth uh, criteria. Uh, and, uh, for instance, uh, the issue of uh, fentanyl in the U.S., uh, the Amazon uh, forest is uh, at a uh, huge uh, risk of all the multinational uh, mafias uh, that uh, come uh, to the south and see uh, South America and China as a subject of a market. Uh, uh, things like cocaine. So uh, there's a very uh, slight, uh, there's a very brittle uh, uh, planet uh, equilibrium. Uh, the water generated uh, by uh, uh, the Antarctic, uh, larger masses of uh, vapor of uh, humidity in the last uh, thousands of years uh, uh, made up this uh, huge uh, CO2 absorption in the forest. It seems that uh, human beings uh, were there before. There's uh, uh, Serengeti from 10,000 years ago and the recent discoveries in Ecuador of uh, urban life. And this uh, shows that uh, before the forest, uh, there were already humans without the forest. But uh, nowadays, uh, humans are there. They're present uh, they, uh, with an uh, economic activity that exploits oil, uh, illegal mining, and uh, huge uh, extensions for extensive uh, agriculture. And uh, but uh, if uh, we uh, break that uh, balance, if that uh, frozen uh, uh, current doesn't continue flowing, or if uh, economic uh, uh, activities are continuing the way they are operating, then uh, we'll come to a point of no return, something irreversible for uh, the existence of uh, humans. Uh, today, there's a huge uh, CO2 uh, stag chimney in, the, in North America and a, a sponge in the South that is uh, partially absorbing that uh, CO2, partially only. And if uh, we uh, do away with the forest, there's nothing else uh, we can do because we would uh, reach that uh, point of no return. This is why the Amazon uh, is not just a strategic. A strategic is not the word. The word is vital for uh, human species. And therefore, we are facing uh, 
the problem of what to do. There are many efforts being made uh, by indigenous peoples, efforts uh, done by uh, national locals and uh, so-called uh, cooperation that reaches uh, 20, 15, 20 million dollars uh, from time to time, and this does not suffice. This is not enough. The vital reality of uh, the Amazon, the actions that are being proposed so far in order to preserve it, is uh, insufficient. And uh, aside from uh, the efforts uh, being made by indigenous uh, peoples, we've tried to uh, make uh, estimates, and uh, we know that we need a flow of uh, $2.5 billion a year in order to revitalize uh, this uh, deforested uh, space and in order to start uh, building a bioeconomy, an economy with uh, the uh, forest and not against it. And this means uh, sustaining, uh, supporting the population that lives there until they can uh, uh, sustain themselves uh, I'm going to give you an example. For instance, uh, $15 million that is being given as a, as a, uh, international cooperation. Uh, this is nothing. This is just a greenwashing. Uh, just uh, uh, um, if we speak of uh, Brazil and Peru, this is nothing. It means nothing. It's a ridiculous amount. And we are proposing uh, something different, a mechanism that has to do with the financial system. Because if we don't act upon the financial system, on the global system, there will be no mechanism to finance uh, the uh, climate action that is needed. In the case of Colombia, what we propose is not called Operation. What we propose is uh, for us, uh, ourselves, uh, to finance uh, this uh, climate action that is needed for the Amazon uh, forest. But to this end, uh, we need to lead our own uh, resources. Uh, and, uh, this, uh, and this amount of $2.5 billion a year. And how do we do this? Uh, how can we do this? This can be done by exchanging uh, uh, debt, that is, to uh, transform the world of financial system. Uh, and uh, this is a powerful uh, funding mechanism of uh, climate action, something which on a universal scale uh, represents a complete change. Uh, Brazil, in exchange of our proposal, which has to do with issue CO2 uh, rights, uh, Brazil uh, proposed something that is much uh, simpler, much uh, softer, that is uh, for us not to be charged uh, country risk on the other, way the other way around, because if we take care of the Amazon, the risk for the world will decrease. And um, because uh, country risk is uh, an added interest rate of our debt, uh, so if this uh, becomes zero, that is just like the U.S. or uh, Europe, uh, um, this would uh, this uh, would represent. Uh, this would mean that we would have uh, many more resources available in order to fund this. Uh, revitalizing of the Amazon forest and to preserve it and have it under Colombian sovereignty. And this should this be done uh, throughout the whole Amazon basin, we would have a very powerful mechanism in order to help uh, the Amazon uh, forest. So I'm to be Mas já que uh, a ministra Marina Silva falou de, de matrizes energéticas, de combustíveis fósseis, presidente Petro. Fossil fuels, uh, you have also spoken about this topic, and I would like to speak about this. And Marina and President Petro talked about uh, the exploitation of oil in the Amazon. I was at Oil Park. Uh, two or three minutes ago, Oyapok River. And we have to think about the environmental impact of the Amazon Basin. But I could see with my own eyes the settlements that are being um, built around the airport, especially, because of the possibility of oil exploration there. So there's a social and urban impact that can be felt in the communities of the region. So, Ilan, with the Development Bank, 
what is the approach of a development bank when we talk about oil exploration in the Amazon basin, in your opinion? There are several, several uh, sovereign discussions, and every country arrives at its own conclusion. From the point of view of a development bank and global resources, we leave that kind of resources up to other agencies. In our case, funding is not for that kind of exploration. We concentrate in clean energy on management, uh, uh, Amazon management, Amazon always, Amazonia sempre. We concentrate on uh, the funding where we believe this leads to public good, where you have externalities and uh, that the whole planet can benefit from. This does not mean that every country can make its own decision or cannot make its own decision, and we will not mingle with uh, the sovereignty of every country. But from the global point of view and public good, we multilateral banks concentrate on other priorities. Minister, when Brazil and yourself have a very strong agenda uh, on this regard. Brazil has nevertheless signed with OPEC, so we have a two-fold kind of position. I would love to hear you about the exploration of oil in the Amazon. I think that there's a discussion that takes place in two fronts. The first one is related to this more um, wide scoping discussion I talked about before, oil producers and oil consumers. And this is where we're going to find our pathway. We want to move away from the dependence from fossil fuels, as President Lula said in his opening uh, speech at the COP. And we want to transition and put an end to the use of fossil fuels. The other discussion is the sovereign discussion within every country. In the case of Brazil, this decision is made by the Energy Policy Council, CPE. And I was talking to Minister Alexandre saying that we should hold a strategic discussion about energy um, security, talking about the contribution of Brazil towards the transition for the end of fuel uh, uh, use, fossil fuel. There is a contradiction of a fossil matrix and the transition. There are $7 trillion that are uh, sent in subsidies for fossil fuels, and we do not manage to get the 100 billion in order to make the ecologic transition of the planet. So it's a strategic decision around the world and inside every country. In the case of uh, the oil in the Amazon, we have denied this license twice, one in 2018 and now under my administration for environmental reasons. It was not for, say, uh, to say that uh, oil cannot be exploited in Brazil, because this is not a decision made by the Environmental uh, Ministry, but rather the uh, Energy Policy Council. What I have defended is that the oil corporation should, as quickly as possible, become energy produ producing uh, corporations. And if there is a country that can be a major, clean, safe, renewable energy producer, that country is Brazil not only for itself, but also to help the planet's uh, matrix with green hydrogen. Brazil has made a bold decision of zero deforestation. Colombia is making a decision about oil zero, zero oil. And I think that these are valid discussions. At some point, we are going to meet. I believe that Colombia, at some point, is going to say zero deforestation. And the humankind will also have to say zero oil. But right now, we have a process that is making a contribution for this discussion with issues that are very sensitive. Brazil operates on both fronts. It is an oil-producing country, and it is a country that had major emissions because of deforestation. That has been brought down by 50 percent in this first year of President Lula administration. We had already had a 83 reduction in the first few years of the previous Lula administration. We, uh, we have 
created protection areas from 2003 to 2008. The world, therefore, is living through a contradiction, but the end of it means that we will have to face the fossil fuel problems. We will have to hold this discussion with those who produce and who consume oil, and every country in its sovereignty will find its own pathway. But uh, President Lula has set a term of reference. We have to move away from fossil. How we are going to find this pathway is up to Brazil and for the rest of the world. President, please. Bueno. We haven't just uh, said uh, zero deforestation. Apart from this, uh, we have to re-strengthen the uh, deforested uh, space. Uh, in the case of Colombia, we're speaking about three million hectares, huge uh, prairies, and uh, 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 that is the statistics of not uh, not reaching zero, but rather having positive uh, uh, numbers with the growth of the uh, forest in the Brazil. This is much more complex because we're speaking about 27 million people. In our case, we're speaking about hundreds of thousands. In Colombia, we've uh, taken more care of uh, the forest, but obviously there are economic factors that are uh, uh, harming it, but there's a huge uh, contradiction and a paradox. The uh, forest is a CO2 sponge, but uh, it's also, but there's uh, the chimney, the stack of oil. It's the use and exploitation of uh, oil and uh, gas in uh, northern uh, capitalism. The huge uh, chimney of CO2 is the US, Canada, the European Union, China, and Japan. It, their first responsibility is to turn off that stag, that uh, chimney, that is to no longer use oil. Uh, uh, and this uh, leads to a clash of economic uh, interests uh, that we are debating on here in Davos and at the COP. The word uh, fossil fuel as uh, uh, causing uh, uh, environmental crisis is something that was only mentioned in uh, an oil producing country uh, COP. Uh, so uh, this is something that's uh, delegated right now. This is delegated on uh, uh, Congo and other countries. That is the, the task of taking care of the sponge as if uh, the sponges, as if these uh, uh, forests could mitigate uh, the chimneys in the north. And this is not uh, so, because uh, forests will burn if uh, chimneys in the north uh, keep uh, burning, and this will represent the end of uh, human beings. And this is something that scientists are saying. So therefore, we countries are taking care of the forest, and uh, whom are not given the possibility of uh, of uh, carrying our transformations in order to empower our own funding, in order to take care of the forest, because the system hasn't changed. It's still the good old system. So therefore, uh, we need uh, to uh, must uh, we let uh, those forests to exploit uh, oil or other fossil fuels. Uh, 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 in the ancient days, the sea reached the Andes, but right now we have Ecuador, Colombia, and this uh, band, this area, is absolutely essential uh, because uh, there's no other water apart from the one that stems from the Andes. Uh, and range. And this ecosystem, if it is disrupted, it will not just uh, destroy or kill the uh, forest, but it will leave uh, all uh, Central American cities in the Andes without water. This is a huge problem. But uh, who is, what is causing this? Well, the extensive use and consumption of uh, uh, coal, gas, and uh, uh, oil. We saw that uh, the ocean left uh, fossil fuels between uh, the forest and the Andes uh, range, huge uh, reserves of oil. And this, uh, this includes the, the largest uh, oil discovery in the last few years, and we allowed for its exploitation. 
And if we allow for its exploitation, we are allowing for the end of uh, human life, not just the forest. Uh, yes, the uh, uh, forest uh, sucks in uh, CO2, but under this, there's uh, oil. It's uh, CO2 absorbed by uh, geological history. And if we exploit and we extract that oil and export it to uh, large uh, chimneys in the north, uh, that will be the end of it. So what are we going to do with the field of Aguyana? Campo Guyana, and uh, this is a huge uh, problem uh, right now. We from Colombia say no more oil exploitation. We signed the non-fossil uh, fuel proliferation uh, treaty, something that's only been signed by uh, islands that are about to disappear. And we want this to be extended to the whole world. The decision must be that of uh, putting an end uh, to the consumption of oil. But this is a problem that pertains to the North. We said that we will no longer take care uh, uh, carry out uh, oil, gas, or coal exploration. We want no more oil exploitation in uh, the Amazon. Without exploration, there will be no exploitation. The uh, forest is more important than the oil underneath. Underneath uh, oil, this is death. But in order to uh, uh, succeed, we need to decrease the emissions of uh, uh, chimneys in the north, and we need to change the world financial system in order to allow for countries' uh, resources to be liberated, in order for them to take care of uh, uh, of the preservation of the uh, Amazon forest. In the case of uh, Guyana, well, Venezuela, uh, that is not here. There is a conflict about to become a military conflict, and we need to compensate Guyana and Venezuela for what is happening so that uh, this oil that's under the Amazon forest in uh, that uh, territory will not come out. And, uh, is, but is the world doing anything about this? Is this something that we could speak of to who, uh, the UK or the US. Um, the possibility of military conflicts, uh, Guyana with the UK, are in the same uh, thing. Human life is what we should consider. And it's not, we should consider not who's the owner of that uh, resource, uh, but rather not to let the oil come out, because if it does, our fight against uh, climate uh, crisis will uh, become uh, uh, nothing. Absurd. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President. I loved to hear Governor Barbano and finally, also, I loved hearing you, but our time is up, so we could go on talking for a long time. Thank you very much, Ilan, Elder, Fane, Minister, and President. Thank you all. Thank all of you who watched us, and may you all have a good evening. Thank you.